How's it going everybody? Daner here with North Central Coins and welcome back to another episode of the most rare and valuable Canadian coins. Today we're going to be counting down the top 5 Canadian quarters that can still be found in your pocket change and if identified correctly can be worth some really good money. Most of the rare or legendary coins that you hear about are so rare that your chances of ever finding them are pretty much slim to nil, but I have done my due diligence to make sure that each and every coin that we discuss on these lists could be sitting in your change jar right now. Even though these aren't your average pieces of currency, just about anyone can find these Canadian coins if you do know what to look for. In this video, we will explore the historical context surrounding the production of these holy grail coins and delve into why they hold such importance in Canadian numismatic history. Additionally, we will discuss any distinguishing features, their significance among collectors, and also potential value if you were ever to find a legitimate example. Before I do get into this, I would really appreciate if you guys would smash that thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and also ring that bell notification so you can stay up to date with my new content. And then without further ado, what do you say we get right into it and break down my picks for the top five most valuable Canadian quarters still in circulation? Let's get it, guys. The Canadian quarter or 25 cent coin is a small circular coin with a reeded edge that is now composed of nickel plated steel and silver in color. The coin's official name according to the Royal Canadian Mint is the 25 cent piece although people typically refer to it as a quarter instead just like they would an American quarter. It is also referred to as a caribou or trente sou in Canadian French. Currently, the Royal Canadian Mint's facility in Winnipeg, Manitoba is where the 25 cent coin is now produced for circulation. Recently, up to 2 billion Canadian circulation coins were struck each year at the Mint's facility in Winnipeg. While the effigy of the reigning monarch has appeared on every Canadian coin produced by the Mint since 1908, reverse designs have changed considerably over the years. The Mint often introduces new commemorative designs that celebrate Canada's history, culture, and values. Now before we get into the 1993 Mule Quarter, I thought I would give you guys some interesting facts you may not have known about the Canadian Quarter. To commemorate Canada's 60th birthday, the release of the first commemorative coin was actually planned for 1927. J.A.H. Macdonald won a competition to design the 25 cent coin. However, the mint did not choose to use the winning entry. The caribou, which is currently featured on the quarter, was actually initially intended for the 5 cent piece. The beaver, which is now shown on the nickel, was actually intended for the 10 cent coin and the blue nose, which is featured on the dime, was intended for the Canadian quarter originally. The 1991 circulation quarter has the lowest mintage of any post-World War II coin. This low mintage was attributable to a work stoppage and also the depletion of supplies in advance of the introduction of the commemorative quarters the following year. Only 459,000 Canadian 1991 quarters, including collector sets and proofs, were actually struck. In 1997 and 1998, no Canadian quarters were actually put into circulation. Only 525,257 quarters were produced in the year 1997. Only 395,617 were manufactured in 1998. None of them were released as common copies, instead they were all released as collector sets or proofs. The design of the caribou on the 25 cent coins dates back to 1936 when the Canadian government changed the designs on the reverse side of coins in response to a change in the sovereign's appearance on circulation coinage. Emmanuel Hahn, a Canadian artist, created the caribou pattern, which was first used in the year 1937. It was briefly substituted in certain years, including 1967 for the 100th anniversary of Canada, where the reverse of the coin featured a Canada lynx or bobcat, and also in 1973 for the 100th anniversary of the Northwest Mounted Police, which featured an RCMP officer on a horse for the reverse, 1992 for Canada's 125th anniversary, and also in the years 1999 and 2000 for the Millennium Coin Program's winning designs. When the Mint issued the 12 commemorative coins in the year 1992 to mark the 125th anniversary of the Confederation, there was one design for each province and territory that had existed in Canada at that time. These actually served as the basis for the 1999 to 2008 US 50 State Quarters Initiative. 
Each quarter featured a different image on the reverse, which featured a unique design representing each province or territory. Now let's briefly discuss mule coins. A mule coin is not some exotic coin from a faraway nation, rather it is a coin that has a peculiar minting fault that makes it extremely unique. Imagine holding a coin that on the face looks to be of one given denomination, but then when you turn it over, the message is entirely different on the other side. It's similar to having a coin that actually serves two purposes. These coins are the result of a mix-up where mismatched dies were used to strike the coin. The term mule actually refers to the fact that these coins are hybrids like a mule or donkey, combining elements from two different coin designs. It's as if the minting process took an unexpected turn, creating an incredible numismatic oddity. One of the most famous examples of Canadian mule coins comes from the Canadian Paralympic series, where the wheelchair curling coin is muled with the obverse of regular Olympic issue quarters. Instead of having the Paralympic privy, the wheelchair curling coin will have the Olympic privy on the obverse of the coin. This unique combination of designs adds a level of intrigue and collectability to these mule coins. And usually whenever there are unexpected twists in the minting process, it will create a fascinating numismatic anomaly that will attract both coin enthusiasts and collectors alike. Now even though the wheelchair curling mule is an incredibly rare quarter that can be worth some decent money today, we are actually here to discuss the 1993 mule. Now to understand how this coin came into existence, we first have to go back into the year 1991. There was actually a strike at the Canadian Mint, and as I previously mentioned, they had a shortage of supplies. The following year, there was a high demand for coin production to make up for the previous time lost. Tasked with the issuance and release of 12 different designs for the 1992 Provincial Series, the Canadian Mint was most likely overburdened, and there were several notable errors and variations that you can look for in this date range, but due to all this commotion, it would seem that a few 1993 Canadian Quarter Reavers pieces were accidentally paired with the obverse dies from the previous year. So to identify the 1993 mule, it is actually pretty simple because it will have the date 1993 and the caribou design on the reverse side of the coin, and it will have the diadem portrait of Queen Elizabeth on the obverse, as well as the double date of 1867 to 1992 underneath her bust or portrait. This is the result of a mix-up where one of the employees most likely forgot to take one of the dies out of the presses from the previous year or run. Either way, this quality control mix-up has opened up the coin heavens and rained down a nice holy grail piece for us to look for. Now some of the details and specifications for this coin, if any of them are off, it may indicate that the coin is not legitimate or authentic. 1993 quarters are composed of 100% nickel. They have a weight of 5.05 grams, a diameter of 23.88 millimeters. They have a thickness of 1.58 millimeters. The coins were designed and engraved by Dora de Pedri Hind and Ago Aran for the obverse and Emmanuel Hahn for the reverse. The edge of the coin is reeded, it is magnetic, and it has a die axis in metal alignment, as is the standard for most Canadian coins. Now something important to note is if you were to discover a 1993 Canadian mule quarter, it would most likely be out of a proof set from the year 1993. If you do send one of these away to be graded, it will get the PL attribution, meaning that most of these 1993 mules, if not all of them, are probably coming out of 1993 proof sets, but that doesn't mean that you have a 0% chance of finding one of them in the wild. Some of them may have made their way out into circulation. You never know with a coin like this, especially when it is a mule and an heir, like the 1993 mule. Now, if you were to send one of these away to be graded by PCGS, it would get a PL attribution, not the MS or not the SP. In terms of value, it is actually extremely rare and valuable. If you are able to cherry pick these out of a proof set, you can make a massive profit, even if you pay 30 or $40 for the set, because this coin can actually be worth around $21,000 for a PL65 and all the way up to $26,000 for a PL66, which as we know right now is currently the highest graded known example. So this is a Canadian coin that is pushing the $30,000 mark and the great thing about it is it is fairly modern. A lot of the time when it comes to Canadian proof sets, people like to cherry pick out the 1991 and 1992 sets. In the year 1992, they actually released a special issue caribou quarter with the double date 1867 to 1992 on the reverse of the coin. And you can only get those quarters out of proof sets. So a lot of the time people like to buy the proof sets so they can get that special caribou quarter. So most likely these 1993 sets probably fly under the radar and you might be able to get a good deal on one. And if you can actually look at the set before you buy it, 
you might be able to open it up and take a look at the quarter. And if the quarter has the 1993 Caribou reverse, and then it has the double date of 1867 to 1992 on the reverse under the Queen's bust, then you have yourself a holy grail coin. What do you guys think about the Canadian 1993 mule quarter? What would you ever do if you found a legitimate example or if you ever have found any of the coins discussed in this video? Let me know down in the comments. I would love to know. Canadian coin errors encompass a fascinating range of anomalies that arise during the minting process. Influenced by factors like coin dyes, planchette quality, striking pressure, and also mechanical issues. These errors can come in all shapes and sizes in various forms, altering the appearance of the coins. Now let's briefly go over some of the different errors and how they can affect the value of the coins. First, there are die errors. These errors originate from issues related to the coin dies themselves, and they can include double dies. This happens when the die is engraved with multiple impressions of the design. It can result in doubled or overlapping features on the coin. Strongly double dyed coins, especially if well preserved, are highly sought after by collectors and can command significant premiums. There are also die cracks and clashes. Damage to the dies from overuse or time can lead to distinctive patterns on the coins such as cracks or clashes. While not generally considered as valuable as double dies, coins with prominent die cracks or clashes can still be desirable to collectors. Planchette errors. These errors stem from imperfections in the coin's blank metal disc or planchette, and these can include off-center strikes, and this happens when the coin is struck off-center where the design is misaligned. This can increase a coin's value depending on the visibility and impact on the design. There are also clipped planchettes. This happens when a portion of the planchette is missing. It results in planchette clips, which can also enhance a coin's value. There are several other planchette flaws like laminations or other flaws in the planchette that can affect the coin's appearance and potentially make it more valuable. Striking errors. These occur during the coin press operation process and can include off-center strikes. These are coins with improper centering due to striking errors and they can become collectible if the error results in a visually appealing and unique design. Overstrikes. This happens when the coin is struck multiple times with different dies. It can create interesting variations and increase its numismatic value. And then last but not least are mechanical errors. Now mechanical issues within the coin press can lead to errors like machine doubling where the design appears flattened or doubled due to die movement during the strike. Machine doubling errors are more common and generally have lower value compared to other rare error types. And then there are rotated die errors, which are the errors that you are looking for on these Canadian provincial quarters. Now rotated die errors on Canadian coins are intriguing anomalies that occur when one of the two coin dies is misaligned or becomes loose during the minting process, resulting in a rotation of the design. These errors can be classified into two main categories, stable rotation and dynamic rotation. Stable rotation. In stable rotation errors, one of the dies is misaligned during installation, leading to consistent rotation and multiple coins produced from the same die pair. This type of error is characterized by a fixed degree of rotation and can be exemplified by certain coin examples, such as a piece that is meant to be struck in metal alignment, but when you are looking for the rotated die variety, it always comes in coin alignment or with a fixed degree or axis. And then there is dynamic rotation. Dynamic rotation errors occur when one of the dies becomes loose during the striking process and rotates on its axis. These errors result in varying degrees of rotation and can be found on a wide range of Canadian coins, including those from the pivotal year 1967. Now, how do you calculate the rotation degree of your coin? To determine the rotation degree of a coin, you need to measure the extent to which the one side of the coin has rotated in relation to the other side. Now the easiest and most tried and true method I can suggest for checking if your coins are off axis or are rotated is to put it in a coin flip, look at the one side and then flip your coin over and then if it is off axis then you have yourself one of these rotated dies. Coins with a rotation degree below 15% are generally not valued much higher than their regular counterparts unless it is in a very high mint state. The coin's year of issue can also influence its desirability among collectors, coins with more notable dates like the Provincial Series that we're discussing today, and also the 1999 and Millennium Quarters can have rotated dies that are notable, and those are known to be very valuable if you do find a rotated die on let's say a 1980s nickel or quarter, it might not be as valuable as if it occurs on one of the coins like the ones we're discussing on this list. 
Now, what do you say we get into some of the details and specifications and also values for the coins that you guys are here to find out about? And those are the 1992 Provincial Quarters with rotated die axis. So first of all, we will discuss the 1992 New Brunswick. The specifications for the 1992 New Brunswick standard circulation strike, it is composed of 100% nickel. It has a weight of 5.05 grams, a diameter of 23.88 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.58 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Dora de Pedri Hunt and Ago Aran for the obverse, and Ronald Lambert and Sheldon Beveridge for the reverse of the coin. The edge is reeded, it is magnetic. The standard die axis for Canadian coins is usually in metal alignment but there are actually two different rotated die variations for the 1992 New Brunswick. There is one with a 90 degree shift rotated die and there is also one in coin alignment. So what I'll do is I'll go through and I'll give you guys the details and the low end values of all of these coins and then I will tell you guys the values of these pieces if you were to find one and it scores in the MS range. So if you were to find a New Brunswick 1992 Provincial Quarter and it is in coin alignment, which means it is rotated 180 degrees, it can be worth around $50 for an AU50. Now the New Brunswick with a 90 degree rotation is not actually listed for values on the low end, but I would estimate that you can get at least as much as the coin alignment, if not a little bit more because it is pretty valuable in the MS region. Now next up is the 1992 Northwest Territories. The specifications for the 1992 Provincial Northwest Territories quarter is composed of 100% nickel. It has a weight of 5.05 grams, a diameter of 23.88 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.58 millimeters. The Northwest Territories Provincial Quarter was designed by Dora de Pedri Hunt and Ago Aran for the obverse, and Beth McKeachin, Ago Aran, and C. Safioti for the reverse of the coin. The edge is reeded, it is magnetic, and the standard die axis should be in metal alignment. Now, the rotation that you are looking for for the Northwest Territories is a 90 degree rotation. If you can identify this, on the low end, it can be worth around $120 for an EF40 and all the way up to $122 for an AU50. Now, the last of these 1992 provincial rotated die quarters that you can look for is the Saskatchewan. The specifications for the standard issue Saskatchewan quarter is composed of 100% nickel, has a weight of 5.05 grams, a diameter of 23.88 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.58 millimeters. It was designed and engraved by Dora de Pedri Hun and Ago Aran for the obverse, and Brian E. Cobb and Terry Smith for the reverse. The reason that I wanted to give you guys the specifications on all of these quarters is because there are actually different artists that feature their designs on the reverses of these coins and I wanted to give credit where credit is due. Now the edge of the 1992 Saskatchewan is reeded, it is magnetic, and it has a standard die axis in metal alignment, but the orientation that you are going to be looking for to identify this holy grail piece is in coin alignment. Now there are only three known examples of the Saskatchewan in coin alignment currently, but that doesn't mean that one can't still be discovered. They actually don't even list low end values for this coin because there isn't one that is in such a low grade that it is actually worth listing on their site. But I would estimate that you could get anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to a thousand dollars, even for a super low grade example at the bottom of the Sheldon scale, because there are only three known examples, this would be considered a holy grail piece and definitely a good one to keep your eyes out for. Now in terms of the high end values, the 1992 New Brunswick in coin alignment can be worth around $550 for an MS66 example, which is currently the highest graded known example. Now the New Brunswick with a 90 degree rotation can be worth up to $228 for an MS65 example. For the Northwest Territories, you are looking for a 90 degree rotation and it can be worth up to $348 for an MS65 example. If it did score any higher, you can be sure to see a bit of a price jump. You could easily be talking a $500 to $1,000 coin if it scored around an MS67. And last but not least, we have the holy grail of the bunch, the Saskatchewan and coin alignment. Now there are only three known examples and they only give one price estimate on coins in Canada and that is currently $5,600 for an MS62 example. So if you were to find one of these and it scored any higher around an MS65 to MS67 you could easily be talking a 10 to $20,000 coin they put out a lot of these provincial quarters I've encountered rolls and rolls and rolls of them in my coin roll hunt so these are definitely some good pieces to keep your eyes out for now what do you guys think about these rotations
rotated dye provincial quarters. What would you do if you ever found a legitimate example or if you ever have found any of the coins discussed in this video? Let me know down in the comments. I would love to know. The transition of Canadian quarters from nickel alloy to multiply plated steel in the years 1999 and 2000 was a significant change in the production of Canada's circulating coinage. The switch was primarily driven by cost savings and the need for more durable coins. I'm going to give you guys a quick breakdown of this process so you can understand how this Holy Grail 2000p caribou quarter came into existence. There were several reasons and motivations for the Canadian Mint switching from the nickel alloy to the multiply plated steel. The first was cost savings. The Canadian Mint sought ways to reduce the production cost of coinage. Nickel, which had traditionally been a key component of Canadian coins, was becoming increasingly expensive. Also durability. There was a strong desire to produce more durable coins. Canadian coins, especially the smaller denominations, were susceptible to wear and tear due to their softer nickel composition. Research and development. Prior to the transition, the Canadian Mint conducted extensive research and development to identify alternative materials that would meet the criteria of cost effectiveness and durability. The choice of multiply plated steel was a result of this research. The material offered a combination of durability and cost savings. Multiply plated steel is a composite material composed of several layers. The outer layers are typically made of steel, which is a hard and durable metal. The steel layers are then plated with a thin layer of other metals such as nickel or copper to provide the coins with their desired appearance and properties. These coins then go through design and testing phases. The new quarters were designed to look similar to the old nickel alloy quarters to ensure easy recognition and acceptance by the public. Extensive testing was conducted to ensure that the multiply plated steel quarters met the required quality and durability standards. These included tests for wear resistance, corrosion resistance, and overall coin longevity. The transition from nickel alloy to multiply plated steel coinage took place over a period of several years. New dyes and machinery were put into place to accommodate this new coin material. The existing nickel alloy quarters remain in circulation and can still be found in your pocket change to this day. The minting process for multiply plated steel coinage is similar to that of traditional coin production, involving blanking and nailing, upsetting, striking, and inspection. However, the materials used in the blanks are different, with the new multiply plated steel blanks replacing the old traditional nickel alloy blanks. The Canadian Mint worked diligently to ensure that the public was aware of the change in coin material. They also coordinated with banks and financial institutions and vending machine companies to ensure a smooth transition and exchange of old nickel alloy quarters for the new multiply plated steel ones. This switch to multiply plated coinage was successful and reduced production costs for the Canadian Mint. It did also result in more durable coins that were better equipped to withstand the wear and tear of circulation. The transition did not significantly impact the appearance or functionality of the coins, so it was generally well received by the public. Now the existence of this incredibly rare 2000p caribou quarter in Canada is indeed an intriguing numismatic mystery. While the Canadian Mint switched from the nickel alloy to multiply plated steel quarters between the years 1999 and 2000, the accidental release of only a few 2000p caribou quarters featuring a P mint mark on the obverse under the Queen's bust to indicate that it was composed of multiply plated steel still remains a puzzling anomaly to this day. Now here's an explanation of how a few examples of this coin may have made their way into circulation. It could have been an accidental die mix up. The most plausible explanation for the existence of these 2000p caribou quarters is that there was an accidental mix up of the coin dies during the minting process. Die mix-ups can occur in a minting facility where the wrong set of dies is used to strike a batch of coins. In this case, it would have involved the use of dies meant for 1999 or 2001 P quarters instead of the correct 2000 dies. Now each coin die has a different year assigned to it and are prepared and stored separately in the minting facility. Each die has specific designs for each year and denomination including the image of Queen Elizabeth II for the obverse and usually the caribou design for the reverse. Due to this mix-up, a small batch of the 2000 caribou quarters would have been struck with the incorrect 1999 test token dies or the future 2001 P dies that they were planning on using the following year which featured the caribou design on the reverse. The rest of the 2000 quarters would have been struck using the correct 2000 dies. Quality control procedures and minting facilities are designed to catch errors but they are not foolproof. In this case, an oversight likely occurred during the quality control checks. 
Some of the coins produced with the incorrect dies may have passed inspection due to the similarities in size and composition to the regular quarters. After minting, the coins are typically transported to financial institutions for distribution. If any of the 2000p caribou quarters passed quality control checks, they would have entered the regular circulation stream like any other quarter. Now another large possibility is that some of these quarters may have made their way into pocket change or circulation from being issued to vending machine companies. To ensure a smooth transition and to avoid disruptions in vending machines and coin-operated devices that accept quarters, the Canadian Mint needed to guarantee that the new multiply-plated coinage would be compatible with these machines. To test the compatibility of the new quarters with vending machines, the Canadian Mint produced a batch of test coins or test tokens with the new composition. These test coins were initially struck with the same design as regular quarters to resemble the appearance of circulating currency. Eventually, the Canadian Mint distributed these coins to vending machine manufacturers and companies that operated vending machines across Canada. The companies used these test coins or tokens to calibrate their vending machines and ensure that they would accept the new quarters without issue. So it is definitely possible that some of the 2000p caribou quarters could have made their way into the hands of vending machine companies who could have then held on to them or then passed them down to relatives. Now that you guys have some information on how this coin came into existence, to identify it, basically it looks the same as just about any other regular Canadian quarter. It has the caribou on the reverse, but if you flip it over to the obverse, you want to look for a little P mark or mint mark under the Queen's bust to indicate that it is made of multiply plated steel. If you can find this mint mark on a 2000 reverse Canadian quarter, then you have yourself a holy grail coin. Now from the information that I came across, currently there are only two known examples of the 2000p caribou quarter and you can get around $36,300 for an MS65 example. So if you did find one of these and it was all beat up, worn and been through the meat grinder, so even at the very bottom of the Sheldon scale, you can still expect to get a couple hundred dollars or maybe even a couple thousand dollars for this coin because it is so rare and there are so few of them that exist. And even though it may seem highly unlikely that you could ever stumble across one of these coins, crazier things have happened. I have met coin roll hunters that have had some crazy finds. I'm talking entire boxes of silver coins quarters and even better so always keep your eyes open because you never know what you can find in your pocket change now what do you guys think about these 2000p canadian caribou quarters what would you ever do if you found a legitimate example or if you ever have found or own any of the coins discussed in this video let me know down in the comments i would love to know So before we do get into the value and specifications for the 1991 quarter, I thought I would go over some of the story of how a coin with such a limited mintage can actually come into existence. Coin mintage refers to the quantity of a specific coin design produced by a mint during a particular year or time period. It is a fundamental aspect of a coin's history and production. The rarity of coins is usually measured on how scarce or uncommon they are in relativity to its total mintage. Coins with lower mintages are generally considered more rare because there are fewer of them available to collectors or the public. Several factors contribute to the rarity of a coin, including mintage numbers. Coins with low mintage numbers are inherently rare. When fewer coins are minted, there are fewer available to collectors to acquire. Survival rate. The number of coins that have survived over time also affects rarity. Coins that were well preserved or saved by collectors are more likely to be available today. Melting and withdrawal. Changes in composition or economic factors like the alloy recycling program can lead to the withdrawal and melting of coins. This reduces the number of surviving specimens and increases the rarity of some dates. Coins that have garnered significant collector interest tend to be less common in the market due to collectors acquiring and holding on to them. Rarity is a critical factor in determining the value of a coin. Generally, rarer coins command higher prices in the numismatic market. Collectors and investors are often willing to pay a premium for coins that are difficult to obtain due to their limited availability. The condition or grade of a rare coin can also significantly impact its value. Coins in excellent condition are more desirable to collectors and can fetch higher prices. Usually coins with low mintage figures will also hold some historical significance. They may mark a special period, event, or a change in coinage history. This historical context adds to their appeal and value. Numismatists value coin that provide insights into the past and low mintage coins often do just that. Collector preferences can drive demand for specific coins. Coins that are part of a series or set have unique designs or represent specific milestones and are highly sought after. 
Collector demand can create competition and influence prices, particularly for rare and desirable coins. Market trends including auction results and changing collector taste can impact the value of coins. Prices for some key dates may fluctuate based on market dynamics and also demand from buyers. Another major factor that could have led to the creation of the Canadian 1991 quarter is labor disputes and strikes. Labor disputes, strikes, or work stoppages at a mint can disrupt normal coin production operations. Mint employees, including coin press operators, engravers, and other key personnel may participate in strikes to demand better working conditions, higher wages, or other labor-related issues. Strikes often lead to production delays as mint facilities may operate at reduced capacity or cease production altogether during this strike period. This can result in a backlog of coins that need to be minted once the strike is resolved. A strike can directly impact the mintage numbers for a given year or denomination. If the work strike occurs during the planned production window for a particular coin, the mint might not actually be able to produce as many coins were as originally intended. This can lead to a lower mintage for the affected coin. Strikes may also affect the quality of coins produced during and immediately following the strike period. Mint employees returning to work after a strike may need some time to ensure that the coin presses and equipment are operating smoothly, potentially impacting the quality of the struck coins. In the case of the 1991 Canadian quarter, if there was indeed a strike at the Canadian Mint during that year, it could have contributed to the lower mintage of quarters for that specific date. The disruption in production and potential quality control issues may have led to a scarcity of well-struck uncirculated specimens further enhancing the coin's rarity and desirability. Now, some of the reasons that the 1991 Canadian quarters are considered so rare compared to their counterparts in the similar date ranges. In 1991, the Canadian Mint produced a significantly lower number of these quarters compared to other years. This limited mintage is a key factor in the coin's rarity. The exact reasons for this low mintage are not always publicly disclosed by mints, but there are a few potential explanations. Economic factors. Economic conditions can influence a mint's decision to reduce coin production. In times of economic uncertainty or budget constraints, mints may reduce the production of certain denominations, including quarters, to save on costs. So, foreseeing the production of the 1992 Provincial Series, they may have actually reduced the size of the production run for 1991 quarters. I don't think they intended to reduce it that small, but that would definitely be a good reason right there. Supply and Demand if there was a surplus of quarters from previous years in circulation and a reduced demand for new quarters, the Mint may have decided to produce fewer coins to avoid an oversupply. While the reverse design of the 1991 quarter was not unique or commemorative, it's possible that the Canadian Mint still opted for a lower mintage that year based on their production plans and priorities. Over time, the low mintage of the 1991 quarter gained the attention of coin collectors and numismatists worldwide. The combination of a low mintage figure and the regular design led to increased demand among collectors, further driving up its rarity and value in the secondary market. Many of the 1991 quarters that were minted entered circulation where they endured wear and tear. As a result, finding well-preserved uncirculated specimens from that year became increasingly challenging, contributing to their rarity. So what do you say we go over some of the specifications and give you guys the potential values if you did ever discover one of these in your pocket change or coin roll hunting. So the Canadian 1991 quarter has a mintage figure of 459,000. It is composed of 100% nickel. It has a weight of 5.05 grams, a diameter of 23.88 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.58 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Dora Pedri Hunt and Ago Aran for the obverse and Emmanuel Han for the reverse. The edge is reeded, it is magnetic, and it comes in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian coins. Now one of the greatest things about this 1991 quarter is that it is a coin that retains a premium even on the low end. If you find one of these and it's all beat up and been put through the meat grinder and it's at the very bottom of the Sheldon grading scale, you can still get some decent money for it around five to ten dollars which is a decent profit considering that you only invested 25 cents to find the coin. But when you start to get into the MS region, you start to see some pretty big price jumps. It can be worth around $10 for an MS60, 
around $20 for an MS64 and all the way up to $120 for an MS66. And this is a coin that's value is only gonna go up over time. It doesn't just have one of the lowest mintage figures of any Canadian coin in the last 50 years, but any coin produced in North America, probably within the last 150 years. This is an incredibly rare coin, but it is one that is fairly modern and they are still floating out there. I've known several Canadian coin roll hunters that have found even a few of these in their coin roll hunts. And I know that you can find them in your pocket change too. So it is definitely a good one to keep your eyes out for. And I only see the value going up on these bad boys as time goes on. Now, what do you guys think about the Canadian 1991 quarter? What would you ever do if you found a legitimate example or if you ever have found any of the coins discussed in this video? Let me know down in the comments. I would love to know. So to start this off, we need to begin with quite the mouthful, which is Georgius VI DEI Gracia Rex ET India Imperator. Yes, quite the tongue twister, right? Well, this translates to George VI, by the grace of God, King and Emperor of India. Quite the royal title if I do say so myself. But hold on to your top hats because this phrase had to go. Why is that, you ask? Well, in the year 1947, India said cheerio to British rule and gained its independence, becoming the Dominion of India and also the Dominion of Pakistan. During this time, the once mighty British Empire was experiencing a rapid transformation as its colonies sought self-governance and independence. The departure of India from British rule marked a significant turning point in history, symbolizing the end of an era for the empire. Coins were still a necessity though. They decided to produce 1947 dated coins while waiting for the new tools and matrices from the Royal Mint. But here's the twist. They actually added a small maple leaf next to the date to signify that these coins were actually minted in 1948. Very sneaky, eh? A numismatic nod to the changing times. Now there are very few coins in the world like the Canadian 1947 dated coins that have nearly as many varieties. Now let's talk about the silver dollars. The silver dollars come in two different varieties, the blunt seven and pointed seven for the silver dollars and several other errors or varieties you can look for. And then there are the 1947 one cent coins or pennies. These exist in two different varieties, the blunt seven and pointed seven. The blunt seven is the scarcer of the two in the world of numismatics. Scarcity means value. It's like finding the golden ticket in a sea of regular chocolate bars. Now the Canadian half dollar does not want to be left out of this seven party. It also has several different varieties for the seven, the curved left seven and the curved right seven. These variations in the design of the seven on these coins may seem insignificant to some, but for collectors, they can make all the difference in determining the value and rarity of a particular coin. The hunt for these unique seven varieties add an extra layer of excitement and challenge to the world of Canadian coin collecting. Now let's fast forward just a little bit into the year 1948, when the new tools and matrices from London finally arrived and the Maple Leaf Coins reign came to an end. The new inscription, George V-I-D-E-I Gratia Rex, which stands for King George VI by the grace of God King, took center stage on the obverse of the coin. This is a clear example of how all coins are not created equal. The silver $1.50 coins from 1948 became unicorns of their time. Why you ask? Well, those change tools and matrices from London took their sweet time to arrive and production started fashionably late. It's like waiting for your favorite artist to drop a new album. The anticipation is real. When the coins finally hit circulation, collectors and enthusiasts eagerly sought them out, creating a frenzy in their numismatic community. The scarcity and unique design of these coins made them highly coveted, adding to their allure and value. And finally, we have the piece de resistance of the 1947 series, and those are the small dot varieties. In a sea of maple leaves on some 1947 Canadian nickels and quarters, there it is. A tiny dot, like a period at the end of a numismatic sentence. The cause? Well, it's a bit like a coin's freckle. Nobody knows for sure. Some say it's dye chips, others blame dye deterioration. Either way, it's a quirky and rare minting error that makes collectors' hearts skip a beat. The small dot variety on 1947 Canadian nickels and quarters is a unique minting error that adds an extra layer of intrigue for collectors. Its mysterious cause resembling a freckle on the coin only enhances its desirability. 
This rare and quirky feature truly captivates the hearts of numismatic enthusiasts all over the world. Now what do you say we get into the specifications and values for the 1947 dot coins starting with the nickels. The 1947 plain date 5 cent coin has a mintage figure of 7,603,724. The 1947 Maple Leaf has a mintage of 9,595,124. And the mintage figure for the 1947 5 cent piece is unknown. Some of the specifications for this coin, it is composed of 100% nickel, has a weight of 4.54 grams, it has a diameter of 21.3 millimeters, on one side and 20.87 millimeters on the opposite side. The designer and engravers for the coin are TH Paget and Thomas Shingles for the obverse and Thomas Shingles and GE Kruger Gray for the reverse. The edge of the coin is smooth, it is magnetic and it has a die axis in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian coins. In terms of value, the 1947 dot nickel actually does carry a premium at the low end. You can expect to get anywhere from five to $15 if you have one that is absolutely beat up at the bottom of the Sheldon scale. So that would be considered an AG3. When you get up to the VG8 territory, it is worth around $27.80, and it can be worth all the way up to $165 for an AU50 example. When you start to get into the MS territory, it can be worth around $270 for an MS60, it can be worth $455 for an MS63, and all the way up to $2,850 for an MS66, which is currently the highest graded known example. If you were to find one and it scored a little bit higher, so we are talking MS67, you could easily be talking a four or $5,000 coin. Now let's get into the 1947.25 cent coin. The mintage figure for the 1947 plain date 25 cent is 1,524,554. The 1947 Maple Leaf Mintage is 4,393,938 and the Mintage figure for the 1947 dot quarter is unknown just like the nickel. The specifications for the Canadian 1947 quarters, it is composed of 80% silver, 20% copper, has a weight of 5.83 grams, a diameter of 23.62 millimeters. It was engraved and designed by T.H. Paget for the obverse and Emmanuel Hahn for the reverse. It has a reeded edge, is non-magnetic, and has a die axis and metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian coins. So let's discuss the values for the 1947 dot quarters. This can also have a premium on the low end. It could be worth probably anywhere from $25 to $40 for an AG3. So that is at the absolute bottom of the Sheldon scale. It can be worth around $67.60 for a VG8. It can be worth $394 for an AU50. Now, as we start to get into the MS territory, we start to see some massive price jumps. It can be worth around $624 for an MS60, $1,200 for an MS63, and $4,590 for an MS65, which is currently the highest graded known example. If you were to find one of the 1947 dot quarters and it did score any higher, then you could be sure to see some massive price jumps. We could easily be talking a $15,000, $20,000 coin if it hit the MS67 mark. Now, once again, to identify these coins, basically, you want to look to the bottom right hand side of the seven in the date 1947. And if there is a small dot in place of the maple leaf, then you have one of these dot coins. You have to be very thorough because the maple leaf, if it is worn down, down or faded can appear like the dot so you definitely want to get a microscope and check it under there or at least zoom in very close with your phone and then you want to get a second opinion before you actually do show it to anyone or try to sell it because chances are it is probably a 1947 maple leaf but these things are out there and you do want to know how to identify them and what to look for. What do you guys think about these 1947 dot coins? What would you do if you ever found a legitimate example or if you ever have found any of the coins discussed in this video or any that are similar? Let me know down in the comments. I would love to know. I would also really appreciate if you guys would hit that thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and also hit that bell notification so you can stay up to date with my new content as it is being released. But I think that is pretty much gonna do it for this one, folks. So thank you all so, so much for watching. But until the next one, everybody. Peace out and have a good one, y'all.